All right, welcome to the Daily Fantasy Flex Podcast, the PGA edition. I'm your host, Brian. I'm joined, as always, by Colin Davey and Peter Jennings, a.k.a. CSU Ram 88. In this podcast, we are going to briefly recap the Kareem Breyer Classic and then jump into the John Deere. Uh, and we will uh, maybe touch just a little bit on the British Open because we just had salaries uh, released. We're recording this Tuesday morning. Uh, salaries were released yesterday, so we'll uh, – Definitely talk about all these tournaments here. Uh, again, I'm joined by Pete and Colin. Colin, what's happening, dude? So before we get into an actual golf, I have one burning question that I want to run by you guys uh, after last night, and that is, how far do you think Aaron Judge can drive a golf ball? Oh, God. Um, like, I think, like, I mean, I don't know if it's DJ territory, but just, like, I, I, well, I want to see that more than anything in my life at this point. Like if he actually got hold of one? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he golfs. Like all, they all golf, right? So it's not like we, this is an unsolvable question. So, like, do you think he's cracking 300? Oh, dude. If oh, he yeah. practiced even yeah. like a little bit, he'd outdrive DJ by a mile. He's 6'7", 280, you know? Yeah, he's a big man. <laughs> he's, he's designed with, with all sorts of flexibility. I mean, he's designed to hit things far. So I think yeah. – yeah time he would he'd be able to hit I, how, I believe that uh how oh accurately God, he could hit it is a question but like if you gave him a hundred and he just got to wind up on one uh he would smash one for sure yeah i think he, I mean, he's debatably in like long drive contest territory i mean like oh, shockingly yeah. world-class athlete but just like i oh like it just like let's make that an off-season thing where like aaron just a reality show called like aaron judge hits things and it's just <laughs> i feel for that man. It was bittersweet for sure because, like, as a Cubs fan, I want to believe that mm. Kyle Schwarber is baseball's true large adult son, but I think Aaron Judge has unquestionably taken over the handle for the time being. Yeah. Schwarber's barely uh, keeping up in the major leagues, man. He's had to yeah. go back. Yeah. I know. Yeah. That's why it's, it's, it's bittersweet. Like I said, I hope it becomes competitive, but it's not in the meantime. So. Yeah, yeah, he's been bad. All right, I guess should we talk about oh. golf? I guess, like, all right, yeah. we'll get back to it. Uh, congrats to Xander, by the way. Yeah, the big X. Yeah, yeah. Xander winning his first uh, tournament, and then he promptly got a six-five price tag at the British Open, uh, which means that he should be real chalky. I think oh, <laughs> so. That'll yeah. be fun. <laughs> Um, I'm happy. I think like, you know, once a year, we're pretty good on calling out like the, you know, the guy that we got it on ground floor and they're going to have some success. I think like we're yeah. debating with the C gear. Even Xander was still pretty under owned for his price tag last week. Oh yeah. I, I think that door has pretty well closed. He's arrived for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope that, you know, the listeners got in like while the getting was good. Um, time to move on to Trey Mullinax now for the, uh, <laughs> the, the the next like underrated rookie that no one's talking about. But uh, I was pretty happy that I, f I feel like we were one of the first to, uh, you know, get in on him. So good for him. And uh, it, this guy that just went crazy, uh, Sebastian Munoz, he's a rookie, right? Yeah, I, he was out of nowhere. He know. came out of nowhere. Yeah, nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think he's that good. Yeah, well, no, I, yeah, he played I, over. I, a no, yeah. that's a, this is a Siwoo Kim type of thing where like he can bank a one turn one tournament mm -hmm. in a lower leverage spot. But yeah, I'm I, that's a bridge too far for me. So yeah, far. yeah, agreed for sure. Uh, but yeah, I mean it was a fun tournament. I mean uh, even these these smaller tournaments. I mean there's big GPPs uh, every week. Uh, we were talking off pod that we wish that the GPP for GPPs for the Scottish Open, which is the Euro event this week, uh, really loaded field with Rory and Ricky and. Um, the, a, lot, a lot of good golfers. We wish those were a little bit bigger, but I mean, yeah, I mean, we're seeing big GPPs for the Greenbrier for the John Deere this week. Uh, just a, a good time to play in some PGA DFS. How was your week, Pete? Uh, my week was okay. I did well in FanDuel, did bad in DraftKings. I only got one lineup in. Um, just been super busy with real golf. Last week was uh, I shot my record uh, score, which was just outrageous. I had a chip and free eagle, shot a 73. Wow. And of course, Collins played a bunch from the tips, so uh colin also you shot an 84 recently yeah that's the best one to date so far it's almost resembling a real score the driver driver was working well uh i actually know that's the funny <clears throat> part so it was despite the driver uh driver is working better just, now so like i i may be sniffing 80 by the time the summer's over just ripping that uh hyper um, mode, huh? yeah i should really yeah it's uh that's the one thing that hasn't gone away it's uh definitely my favorite one to hit <laughs> awesome yeah so I, his, his hybrid. I got a bunch of uh i have my big tournament uh at the club i'm at this week and also uh have a big trip coming up with a lot of dfs guys up in the mountains so 
real golf has been, you know, front and center for me, but I'm uh, very <laughs> excited for golf this week. And then obviously the British Open will be fantastic. Uh, already right. that. Obviously we're in the Major League Baseball All-Star break, so yep. kind of a lull in DFS, but uh, it's going to be really nice to have this tournament. Then obviously uh, the Open is going to be fantastic. Definitely. Yeah, great time to play some PGA DFS, whether you – Want to jump in here for the John Deere or whether you want to start researching for the British? Uh, it's definitely a good week to do so with MLB gone. All right, let's jump into this week's tournament. Uh, we're going to not really talk about the Scottish Open if you want to go play. Uh, again, the field is, is pretty solid. It's actually uh, uh, much better than the John Deere, but uh, we're sticking to the John Deere just because that's where – uh, the action on DraftKings and FanDuel is. So uh, this is a tournament that's played in Illinois. Uh, it is uh, pretty much always the, the week before the British Open, which is sort of notable uh, because uh, it is very far away from uh, the British Open. It is uh, six time zones away, which is uh, really the reason why that a lot of these studs are in Scotland playing at the Scottish Open, which is just uh, really close to um, – to England so that, that that's sort of why that field is loaded uh, this field's not so great um, and uh, you know I think we can maybe talk a little bit about whether the time zone is going to affect it I know that the John Deere does charter a flight for uh, some of these guys so uh, it may not be a huge deal in 2017 we can get into that maybe a little next week but um, uh, th this course is 72 hundred yards par 71 uh, Colin I'll kick it to you what sort of uh, players do well here uh, it's a pretty easy one. It's been accuracy for sure. Um, I mean, the only time that trend didn't happen is like last year. Uh, I'm inclined to throw that out uh, as a fluke unless I get some more information that there's some pretty big course redesign. But yeah, like distance is a wash. Accuracy is a strong ping GAR. Like, yeah. And then putting gets a minor like boost, which is something we don't see too often. But I'm going... Uh, probably like accuracy, like 80, 90 percent, and then the, maybe yeah. the uh, remainder in putting. Um, That's because Spieth and Stricker has won, have won like combined five of the last seven <laughs> events. That's got to be, yeah, that's got to be it or something. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, Pete, that makes sense to you, accuracy? Yeah, that's why I think it is. I do like the putting angle. There's a couple guys uh, that if you want to take the putting angle, we can talk about also – one thing that's uh, important here, if you want to look into it, uh, you know, basically the Bermuda greens, uh, I think is going to be interesting. So um, we'll see. I think this is going to be a, uh, an interesting week. The one thing that is a little subjective is are any of these guys trying to get over to Europe? Uh, yep. Obviously playing. I think they're not worried about that, but we do have uh, a little different week in that the, the open is the main focus of all the top players. So, the one really valuable thing that you can do that could potentially be an edge is just pay attention to uh, any withdrawals leading up to it. Um, yeah. you know, anytime it's a week before a major, I think that's just a little bit more likely to happen. So yeah, yeah I think the accuracy angle makes sense. Uh, definitely pay attention to that. And some of these guys are, are do have big incentives, so pay attention to those golfers as well. Yeah, definitely a week to uh, at least wake up quickly to make sure that there's no withdrawals. Uh, it is in early tea time or early lock time rather at 6 a.m. on Thursday. So uh, maybe set your alarm for 5.30, quickly check and then go back to sleep. Uh, but definitely monitor those because it is a unique week in that it is uh, right before the British Open uh, for sure. Um, real quick question. You know, I think we've discussed this maybe a while ago on a pod, but I don't want to pretend like we don't have any new listeners that may not uh, ha have heard that conversation. Uh, a lot of these scores, Colin, here are, are really low. I mean, last year, Ryan Moore won at 22 under. Jordan Spieth won at, at 20 under. I mean, just going down, uh, it's been like 19 under or uh, better, really, each of the last like eight years. So uh, I guess the, qu the question is, lower scores, who does that benefit? Is it like a rising tide lifts all boats? Do you really want to go for birdie makers or what is what does lower scoring in general do for strategy um i've had a really tough time like figuring out how it changes your process right it's just going to be like whoever goes off goes off or even more but i think it's uh easier hard course is one of those type of it's it's almost like you know the easier hardcore specialist is kind of like that like idea of like a wind specialist where you think that like in theory that person exists that does better in certain conditions but in reality 
it's really hard to figure out if like if someone's done well on easy courses before they will do better on easy courses in the future it's tough to get any predictive signal out of it i think the simpler thing is to just treat it like it doesn't exist i don't have super high confidence in that it's just that i haven't been able to get it to stick so like until i hear otherwise i'm just not letting it change my overall strategy. Um, I, and I know it's tempting to try kind of turn some knobs and mm -hmm. say, oh, it's an easy course, I'll do something differently. But I think you're, in general, you're gonna set yourself up in more trouble if you try to change your approach, uh, yeah. given kind of those superfluous uh, conditions. Yeah, I mean, I guess one argument would be that if it's easy, uh, you could go a little more contrarian just because you know, some some surprising golfers might surprise more often. I, I get, I don't but know. like we're so heavy on going contrarian in the first place. Yeah, in the first place, like, yeah, yeah, that's true. Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Like, yeah. you know, Pete, maybe uh, do you do something differently here? Like, I've always struggled to figure out well, what would I do differently on an easy course. No, I mean you're still you're targeting birdies like you always are, but yeah, I don't think anything dramatically changes. Maybe um, there's certain guys, I guess, that will melt, uh, more often in tough conditions. Maybe you can target them, um, because they're going to hopefully play better in a situation where it's an easy course, but mm -hmm. that's pretty subjective and you have to have high conviction. And I think, uh, you know, the normal stuff is what we're looking at more than anything. Yeah. And Keegan's not in this field. So, um, <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's jump into, uh, the, the field here. <clears throat> Again, it's not a not super strong week, uh, but uh, you know they're still get some GPPs. So uh, I think that uh, you could really take advantage of uh, maybe some ownership here. Uh, Daniel Berger is the highest priced guy at eleven three. Then it goes to Brian Harmon at ten nine, Kisner ten four, Danny Lee at ten two. Those are the guys that are ten k and above. Definitely not the names that you are used to seeing in, in that range. So Pete. Uh, let's just start broadly and then we'll, you can give your thoughts on some specific guys. Uh, what is it going to do for like the stars and scrub versus balance approach that people are going to see Brian Harmon, 10, nine. Am I really going to pay 10, nine for Brian Harmon? Yeah. I mean, this is a pretty crappy week in terms of uh, the top end of the field. So I, I think in general, we'll see people, uh, you know, go a little more balanced. Uh, I think some heavy chalk will be guys like Charlie Hoffman, Kyle Stanley, um, I do think that some people will pay up uh, for Berger and Kisner, um, but there's a lot of guys in this high mid-range. Charles Howes uh, really starting to come together. I think Zach Johnson, even in this field, could uh, garner a decent bit of ownership. And then Steve Stricker is being touted quite a bit as well already. So that like high end, those 9K guys, I think are going to be really popular. So um, not nearly as many stars and scrubs. And, you know, I think you'll see really low ownership on some of these really cheap guys because, you know, if you're cheap in this field, uh, most likely a lot of the people who are playing haven't heard of these guys. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out um, in the regard that I think that most people are going to be balanced. So there could be an opportunity to play a lot of burger lineups, but it's hard to justify, you know, especially someone like Brian Harmon at 10-9. I mean, that it's unbelievable to me that he's the second highest uh, price golfer. Yeah. And I kind of like the, I mean, I almost agree with the line of the balance because like, I'm not sure that like, I actually agree with a lot of this pricing at the top end. I think like the, a lot of like the nine K guys are like right there in terms of expected equity with all the top price guys yeah, yeah. Like that will eventually filter out. Uh, into who's getting touted. So you're going to see a lot of balanced lineups and Pete, I think you're dead on where like everybody will be priced out of burger. Um, Cause like I can see like Danny Lee still being popular just cause he's been playing pretty well and always popular. Um, like, yeah, I, I think Harmon is tougher to pay up for. I think burger is tougher to pay up for, but at the same time, I think that represents an ownership opportunity where you might like people like might not be off them and they're, they they still have decent equity, you know, burger still is the top end of the field. Um, and like, that's maybe one way to buy your way into lower ownership. Um, one thing we did, I forget if we covered this last year, like, are you going to do anything? I mean, some of these guys are playing in the British. Some of them aren't. Um, are you do, I mean, like, I know like, yeah, pre-majors, like we seem to go over this every year and this is a different one considering there's like a flight and a time change to pay attention for. What it's are you far doing away. Yeah. Guys, yeah. What are you, what are you doing with the guys that are playing on the British next week? Yeah. I mean, you have to pay attention to the withdrawal stuff I talked about. I think that's the most objective thing that you can do is just make sure you don't have someone who 
suddenly with draws, but they're committed to this tournament. They're playing it. You know, the top end guys are already mostly over in Europe. Um, you know, I, I like the guys who have a little more incentive this week who probably aren't playing the British. I think that's, uh, or the open championship. That's something that I'm definitely looking at, but, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's easy to overanalyze. I mean, you see it on Twitter and just everywhere else. Everyone's like, oh, I'm, I can't take these guys. They can just punt it off. They're going to play mm-hmm. poorly, and they're just going to try to get over to Europe. And maybe there's a little bit of merit to that for, like, a couple guys. But in general, it's it's really tough to kind of make that conclusion and only play guys who are not playing the Open. So, yeah, I mean, and if you look at the, uh, like, the winners here of the last, you know, eight, ten years, like, it's all been, like, pretty good guys. So um, it's not like – you know, like there's been no names winning because all the guys have been yeah. withdrawing right before. And, and some of these guys like to play a competitive tournament before yeah. they play majors. So yeah. it's a hard thing to, to judge. Uh, you don't have someone like Phil Mickelson or like, I mean, I guess Berger is pretty accomplished at this point, but like no one in this field is going to just completely punt it off, uh, yeah. you know, or do things. I don't know. I, I'd be surprised if like, you know, Phil Mickelson was hitting different shots preparing for Augusta when he played last year mm-hmm. before, the, before the Masters. I don't think that a ton of these guys are going to be doing much different, uh, just, you know, basically peak for the, the open. Obviously they want to play well. They want to yeah. set those up, but yeah. I don't think anyone's going to be hitting shots differently here. Yeah, so I, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a good question whether they're going to start preparing for the British this week, because I, I mean, that is a, a factor and maybe it won't affect them this week and maybe it'll affect them next week. I, I mean, like the, the British is a notorious link style course. Uh, this isn't quite that so I mean Colin do you have any thoughts on that like whether uh, yeah I mean I think Pete might be right where it's not that big of a deal this week but maybe guys that got to play at the Scottish this week maybe have a little bit of advantage because of a similar course I, I don't know maybe that's true yeah no I th- oh, no someone I, I think um Jake Nichols who's been on this pod before looked into that before it might have been him where uh he looks at um how do people like uh, do in the British to play the Scottish versus deer and Scottish does gives you about, give you about a stroke. Um, Interesting. Like, of course, the whole tournament on average, hmm. I think it's somewhere between the, the course layout and the time zone change and the acclimation. Like, yes, yeah. I think there is something to that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, next week, I'm sure like, we'll talk about like, um, like Scottish versus deer who played what and how that affects roster construction. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think that is actually like one of the few narratives that I do believe in. But yeah, I think all else being equal, this idea of like, oh, they're going to mail it in, guys are focused on the British. That seems to me like a classic example of a narrative, the all else being equal, that is like unsupported and people just keying it on because people want to, you know, play fancy narratives that aren't necessarily warranted. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, just really quick before we, we dive down here to uh, a lower salary tier, uh, Colin, you were saying that some of the guys in the 9K range or even a little bit below that are like just as good as the guys in the 10K range. Um, and it seems it seems like that – is it just because like the relationship usually – like there's a, usually a linear relationship between like adjusted round score and price. And like now if you sort by long-term adjusted round, like Berger is definitely the, the number one guy, but then you get to Stricker and Howell and Moore and, and even like uh, Lucas Glover is in the top six or seven golfers. So it doesn't seem like there's as linear of a relationship this week between pricing and long-term adjusted round, which I'm not sure if that means that uh, – there's leverage or that means that there's going to be highly owned guys in the 9k range. I think it's going to be highly owned guys in the 9k range. I think between that and just like people not wanting to pay up for, you know, 10, nine for Brian Harmon. I think people are going to want to naturally go more balanced because like that's where some name recognition is. Um, and it's going to be really tough to pay, you know, like, you know, seven, like sub seven K for some guys that people have never heard of or have never been on the radar uh, all year. Um, yeah, I think if I had to guess who's going to be the most popular this week, I'd actually probably go Kyle Stanley. Um, his ownership's been trending up. I think yeah. he like, he has decent history. Um, like, yeah, I see him being like I, number one by a, a quite a big. Uh, not I think a Stricker will be, will be up there too. I, I, Hoffman's gaining some momentum too. Yeah, Charlie, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. I, I could, He's been so I good think, lately. I think they're going to be top three. Like that's yeah. the shuffle yeah. the order or whatever. But like as of now, they're going to be top three. Yeah, with Howell and Berger probably right up there yeah. too. Pete, like just uh, blend equity and low ownership. And uh, who's your favorite golfer? Like maybe nine k and above that has the best combination of equity and low ownership. Uh because like all these guys are going to be fairly high owned, right? 
Yeah, they're all going to be high owned. I mean, in terms of being contrarian, I guess it's Zach Johnson. He does have a really good course history here. Yeah. He doesn't need to be owned anymore, but I really hate taking him. Uh, it is an accuracy course, so it's nice. Maybe it's Ryan Moore, who also has really good history. For whatever reason, just isn't owned as much uh, relative to these guys. But mm-hmm. it's it's pretty gross at the top. I think uh, yeah. I have a little more conviction with some of these mid-range to lower-end guys in terms of where I can get a little leverage. Yeah, definitely fair. All right, let's move back to uh, move down to the lower tier here, uh, and I think this is going to be an interesting tier because if we think that all of these guys in the nine K range, whether it's you know Howell uh, or you know up to you know the Stanley Hoffman range, uh, maybe these eight K guys are going to be a little bit lower. Uh, we have Streelman right at eight eight, and then we go down to um, you know you go down like Kevin Na at eight K. There's not really many players in this tier as usual, but. Uh, Maybe some guys that we're finally getting into some low ownership. Uh, Colin, I'll, I'll kick to you. I know that uh, Ches is probably just going to be your favorite. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you talk about him and maybe some other guys you like here. I mean, in the 8K, like, yeah. I mean, he, him and Streelman are the only realistic options. Yeah. Um, I think, like, people might be priced out of Streelman a little bit because people are just going to strongly prefer everyone else in that uh, 9K range. So, like, you could see a little bit of ownership drop by the end of it. Uh, for my money, I think even fewer people will be on Revy, though, who has slightly better history, just as good as fit. Um, like, and I think he's in a prime spot. Uh, like, I can see him, like, just nobody's going to be paying 8400 for him, except mm-hmm. for me all day because he's Ches Revy. <laughs> Guy. So that's fine. Do, you, do you think that this range, like, because I always ask, like, which, what is the first golfer with single digit ownership in, in salary? Do you think it's going to be one of these guys, like, whether it's Summer Hayes, Streb, or whoever? I think, no, it's probably going to be Streb. Um, I think just that, you know, his, his odds to win are more in line with like a low 8K guy than a high 8K guy. And I think people key in on that. Um, and I think a lot of those odds are essential. I mean, I don't, at this point, maybe his price is being driven up by a good finish last time. Like he's not a terrible play. I mean, I think he's like, I mean, it's, there's a little bit of loss in value there, but like, is it, it's debatably enough to sacrifice if you want to get down to low ownership. Um, I think he's, yeah, he's the first guy that I see realistically, uh, getting down to single digit ownership, maybe summer Hayes, who's just been under the radar for so long that people are, you know, like slow to come around to him. Um, maybe David Hearn at that point, but like, I think that's just like, you're sacrificing way too much equity and I couldn't justify yeah. paying that. Yeah. Uh, and we're not even talking about Bubba Watson because he will never be a little <laughs> for the foreseeable future. Yeah, yeah, he's tough. Uh, Pete, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts to some guys in this range. And one guy that I do want your thoughts specifically is uh, Bryson DeChambeau. I mean, you know, we had talked about him, I don't know, a year ago at this point, about a guy who, a young guy who could be on the upswing, very analytical. Uh, but he's he had been really bad for a while. He missed one, two, three like eight missed cuts in a row. Uh, but over his last three, 26, 17th, and 14th last week at the Greenbrier Classic. So um, I don't know if you know anything that maybe he's turning a corner or uh, maybe he's just running a little hot. But what are your thoughts on, on Bryson and some other guys in this like 7, 8K range? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of interesting plays. I obviously, uh, at the th- you know, in the mid-range, I love Ches Revy. He's popping number one in my model right now. Uh, going a little bit farther, I think Bryson's really interesting. I think he uh, obviously has been playing better. Um, you know, in these weaker fields, I definitely don't mind mm-hmm. him. Yeah. Uh, my dad has a – my dad's high on him for whatever reason. Uh, if you want to play the putting angle, and uh, I'm obviously below bias towards this guy because I got to hang with him at Tiger Jam, but Wesley Bryan uh, actually is one of the best putters on tour. And uh, he's a guy that – you know, he hasn't been as accurate off the tee, but his proximity and accuracy course is really good, and uh, his putting is just astounding. So I think he's interesting. I think Nick Taylor will garner some ownership. I think uh, Chad Campbell will garner some ownership. Uh, the one guy I'm sure will burn me this week uh, is Johnson Wagner, who uh, I'm not going to take, I don't think, but uh, I was on him last week with the elite course history. I uh, thought he was a good play, and uh, – He's someone who's actually rating decently my model, but I will be off him. He's a late um, course history this week too. I, I know. Yeah. And it's just like, I don't. It's tough. I, don't <laughs> it's tough. I, I, I can clear that one. Yeah. There are a couple, I think this is just a case of like elite course history runs into basically poor form 
uh, and like the average of the two memes is like it's like it's easy to get seduced by saying like I know we've gone back and forth on does elite course history trump recent form and I think like the only time that we, we've been okay with that is essentially when the players can also show signs of like being elite or like war top end I don't think Wagner is even close to that territory so he's a pretty easy fade for me um, Colin, what were your thoughts on uh, – we, last week we talked about Ted Potter, which was this, this random dude in the field who had really good course history at Greenbrier, uh, and we sort of wrote him off, but he actually ended up playing pretty well, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I – like stopped him? Yeah. I am not even close to being ready to draw a conclusion from that. That is just so far yeah. off. Like, yeah, yeah, I have no clue like, either. That, yeah. yeah, like, no, I, I can brush that one off just fine. Yeah, that, that's fair. Yeah, I thought maybe, like, Scott Brown this week would be, like, an interesting test case as well. Like, a guy with really good course history, but not a guy – I, I think Scott normally. Brown is a much better player than Johnson Wagner. I think the course history is mm-hmm. just as much up there – uh, and like, I mean, there's been no stellar results to date, but like, at least like, there's like, you know, with there's the vicinity of like, all right, there's occasional top twenties in the 2017 game log that you can kind of hang your hat on. Um, I, who, I, who do you, who do you, you think is going to be the course history? But it's Brown over Wagner for sure. Yeah. yeah. Who do you think are going to be the chalky guys in the, this range? I mean, like uh, Lucas Glover never seems to have chalk, even though he has good long-term form. Maybe like Chad Campbell, maybe at seven six, would be a little chalky. Um, I think so. I mean, yeah, I I could definitely see that. Um, let's uh, like, who are we looking at? Um, it's probably like usually, you know, it's uh, that seven K, maybe a little lower range is usually where there's some mispriced golfers, but it doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, we have Trey Mullinax who you know, is our maybe rookie now that Xander has uh, um, graduated out of our, our rookie guy that we like. So maybe he's the guy at 7K, but it was, I mean, there's many, many chalky chalk guys. Goes, no, I think people are going to fall back to the mainstay 7K chalk. I say Kevin Tway has always been, like, really owned. Ali Schneider yeah. has been owned. Bud Colley is going to be up there. Yeah. These are guys that are, I guess Bud Colley is a little bit higher priced, but, like, maybe Nick Watney, who's been trending up recently in ownership. Mm-hmm. I think people are just going to kind of go back to the well and, like they see the same prices they guy at the guys where they always buy in that range in a weaker field. Uh, I think they're just going to continue the trend. Um, I've been kind of, I mean, I, I've always had a couple guys that I prefer stronger than them for sure. That same price range. So mm-hmm. like, I'm probably going to be fading them anyway, but I think it's going to be the mainstay, the kind of guys that you always see at that price range uh, that are going to go right back there. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Honorable mention to uh, Dirt McGurk, who always Dirt, seems to be yeah. popular in certain spots. I think this could be absolutely one of those week where he could he's going to crack 12 for sure, uh, yeah. if not 15. Yeah, for sure. Pete, what are your thoughts on some guys in this, you know, like just lower range? Who do you think are going to be chalky? And what are your thoughts on Molinax this week? Uh, I like Molinax this week. Um, in the low end range, you know, one guy that I think is interesting is Curtis Luck. I think he's. Uh, Someone who's really starting to show some good form, obviously a rookie, uh, pretty highly touted. I think he's intriguing. Um, I think that Molinex, like you mentioned, uh, could definitely be a guy here that uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, down, down even a little bit lower, it starts getting a little tricky because a lot of these guys I generally wouldn't touch, but this field is just so terrible that, mm-hmm. you know, I think there's a little bit of merit. The one thing you'll see is I don't think we have anyone projected for like, any ownership really i think that you will be able to get a lot of these guys really cheap so mm-hmm. um you know some guys who are rating alex Sheka is rating well in my model harold garner the third i think he's better than this price relative to the field uh his his play hasn't honestly been that good uh if you want to go accuracy and someone who's done relatively well recently is boo weekly uh but he's a golfer i really never take so there's there's a lot of warts with uh, with everyone, and I guess Boo Weekly has had three missed cuts in his last four starts, and just had that you know top five finish at the Travelers. But yeah, it's pretty ugly down here. Um, I, I don't have a ton of conviction on any of these guys, and which is why I think a lot of people are going to go balanced, and you know especially for cash, that's where I'm looking now. So Colin, you got any other gems that? Uh, I mean, yeah, if you, if you want low owned, like, I mean, the, like, I think maybe like you might have to go case. So if you go bad course fit, but good overall golfer to the, just cause people are going to be off them. I think two guys that picked that bill nicely are Grace Murray and Luke list list. Maybe like he's increasingly some of like the, just the, the 
two bombers, though. Like, yeah, exactly. So, like, they're not a great fit, but I think they're going to be under 5% for sure. Yeah, it's um, just a lot of missed cuts, yeah. Yeah, if you want a guy who, like, is going to have, like, decently – but if you want someone who has some fit – and some history to show some sign of life, like under 7K and still low own. I think my pound for pound favorite is probably going to be Vaughn Taylor, who has done nothing all year, but like just thinking way back then. I mean, he has won an event. I think he, like, I mean, I'm always back and forth on is there this case of upside? And I think, I mean, like, if there's anyone that has some, like, some chance of it, it's probably him. But like, if you look at his log this year, it's actually not a whole lot of missed cuts. Um, I mean, you can like for a 6,600 golfer in a weak field, like it's kind of that, like that, you know, he hasn't cracked the top 10, I don't think once this year. Um, but in a weaker field, like, you know, if, there, if it's ever going to happen, like it probably could be now, um, definitely probably incentivized to put up a high score in a kind of a British yeah. open prep week. Um, yeah. I, I don't hate that as a low on flyer. Yeah, and if he sneaks into the top 10, top 15, I mean, that's uh, a lot of equity uh, as far as uh, and sneaking up leverage. GPP. It's yeah, sneaking up like GPP that. leaderboards. Yeah, so I always ask every week, like, who would be some favorite plays? Uh, like, who's our favorite play under 5% ownership? The, the Martin Laird play of the week, I, I would say. <clears throat> but it seems like we just listed them because I think uh, Taylor and Luke List and a lot of these guys are probably actually going to be under 5% owned uh, just because the, the field is just so – a lot that is just going to be distributed uh, sort of around everywhere. Um, so I think let's pick some winners and uh, let's get out of here and start prepping for uh, the British. All right. I haven't gone middle in a while, so I'll go middle. All right, cool. <clears throat> uh, I'll go first, Pete. Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, and then Pete, you can go, uh, you can go third. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll go burger, sure. I'm sick of picking high price guys. Give me the Kyle Stanley death train. I want to take the roller coaster ride. All right, give me give me Danny Lee, and then we're going below nine k. Below nine k, yeah. yeah. Uh, gosh, there's a couple guys here, but yeah, I'll just. Hmm. I feel like Bud Collier or Summer Hayes is probably more likely to win, but I really want to snipe Ches Reavy from you guys. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll let Ches Reavy maybe get back. God, I, I was the one guy. And I, oh, you can't. You just can't leave him for me, can you? All right, it's fine. I'll take Ches. All Chad right, Reilly. I'll go. I'll go course history here. I'll go Chad Campbell. Chad Campbell. Oh wow, dipping a little bit. Uh, I'll go Collie. Why not? He's probably the smarter play there. All right. Well, that is it. Good luck, everyone in uh, in in the John Deere Classic, or if you are, are actually get some action in the uh, the Scottish Open, that that's great too. Uh, good luck this week, and we'll talk to you guys uh, as we prepare for next week's British Open.